This time we're stepping into 1993 with Nintendo Power issue number 44 for January of that year. Once again, we have some format shifts. In this issue, the order in which systems are covered in has been changed, and there's a special subscriber-only section which I'll be discussing this episode as well. Our cover game for this issue changes companies from Warner Brothers to Disney with the Super Nintendo version of Mickey's Magical Quest. As mentioned in the lead-in, the order of systems has changed this issue, with the Super Nintendo games and NES games swapping places. Additionally, the later portion of the magazine has a selection of articles just for subscribers. Now, the subscribers don't get any coverage of new games, at least not at this time, while they do get some additional strategy information for Super Mario Land 2. In the letters column, we have two letters singing the praises of Mario Paint. Starting off the issue with Super Nintendo games, we have our cover game, Mickey's Magical Quest from Capcom. We have a rundown of the power-ups and maps of pretty much the entire game. Mickey's Magical Quest is a well-balanced and well-put-together platformer. It has the lighter, more storybook tone that we expect from Disney's mascot, and some well-designed, well-done platforming that we expect from a Capcom platformer. Further, because the game is a Disney title, Capcom has balanced the difficulty really well without compromising the level design. By having you respawn at the start of a chapter both when you die and when you continue, it's a very forward-thinking way of designing checkpointing for a platformer. Most games do their checkpointing effectively like this now, so to encounter a game from over 23 years ago that is also doing this is great. Next up is Shanghai 2, a solitaire game played using Mahjong tiles. This iteration of the game is pretty much the most iconic version of the game, and it's been ported to the Super Nintendo. There's information on the rules, several board layouts, and a two-player variant. Shanghai 2 is, has the problem of basically being the flagship of a genre that is absolutely everywhere now, namely Shanghai Solitaire, or rather it's a game that has myriad clones of it. Windows 10 comes with the Shanghai Solitaire game. It's incredibly easy to find games that are Mahjong Solitaire on the Android and iOS stores. Hell, when I was in high school, I could walk into an Office Depot, not a consumer electronics store, not a game store, an Office Depot, walk over to the software rack and find a Mahjong game for 5 to $10. When I was doing technical support, I frequently had to troubleshoot people's Mahjong Solitaire games, or find out what was going on with their computer that caused those games to not work. If, Maj if Shanghai 2 brought something new to the table that all the other games that came later didn't, I cut some slack, but it really doesn't. It's 100% the other way around. The other more recent games have had to put more work and distinguish themselves from the classic, the original, and for that matter, all of everyone else who's trying to distinguish themselves from the original, that the original no longer stands out. Next up is Sonic Blast Man, the first Super Nintendo brawler that we've covered in, in a while. There are some notes in here on the first five stages. Sonic Blast Man is an alright brawler, the one that is not without some notable flaws. First off, you have Limited Continues, which, as I've said before, and will say again, is something that does not serve a purpose on console games. I've bought the proverbial metaphorical arcade machine, I should be able to set it to free play. Second, most of the best brawlers for consoles give you a selection of characters with different play characteristics, so you can pick one who fits your playstyle. Usually a slower moving brawler, a bruiser, a fast scrapper, and then somebody in the middle. 
here you just have the title characters. Movements are a little slower than what I like in my brawler characters. Kind of a less in between um, Guy and Hagar, and more in between Guy and Cody. Slower than the middle of the road guy, a little bit faster than the slow bruiser. I prefer characters, frankly, who give me more of an opportunity to stick and move around my enemies and give me more control of the fight. I like playing Guy. I like playing Maki in Streets of Rage. This game doesn't give me that opportunity. On the other hand, though, instead of giving you a super move that eats a chunk of your life bar, the game gives you a limited stock of your super move, which you can pull off whenever you need it, to either control the flow of the fight, or to manage the health of a boss. It adds a level of, level of resource management strategy that most brawlers don't have, for better or for worse. We next have Equinox, the sequel to Solstice, an isometric puzzle platformer that I played and loathed on the NES. We have level maps for the first three dungeons. The definite advantage Equinox has over Solstice when it comes to game design and platforming is that the game feels like it steers a bit better than the first game, which is a world of difference considering we're dealing with a game that is an isometric platformer. The game also adds some action elements so you can better deal with enemies in the game world. That said, Equinox still has some control and navigation issues. In particular, the game needs an auto-map in some form or another. Even if something super basic, like the map from Legend of Zelda for the NES as far as the game's dungeon are concerned, having some sort of map, which would give you some sort of contextual north, would make the game easier to navigate. Drawing your own map works somewhat, but what I'm looking for here is something that, more than anything else, gives me in real semi-real-time where I am in the game world, and where I've been and what exits there are in this room. To put it another way, the world in Equinox is easier to move around with, around in, than the world in Solstice, which is wonderful and a step in the right direction. But the problem is it's just as hard to find your way around the world as it was in Solstice, and it was a pain in the ass to find your way around Solstice. And in order for an adventure game or dungeon crawler to work, you have to be able to navigate can't navigate, then it's not fun. Moving on, we have a rundown of upcoming sports titles on the Super Nintendo, including on the football front, Madden 93 and Trade West Pro Football. For basketball, there's Bulls vs. Blazers from EA and a Super Nintendo version of LJN's NBA All-Star Challenge. On the hockey side, we have NHLPA Hockey 93, and from Taito, there is Hit the Ice. For tennis, there is Amazing Tennis from Absolute, and Jimmy Connors Pro Tennis Tour from Ubisoft. We have one karate title with Best of the Best Championship Karate. I'd expect more considering the fighting game boom. And three baseball titles. Roger Clemens MP MVP Baseball, Mindscape's Cal Ripken Jr. Baseball, and Namco Super Battle Up. Batter Up, making for... 12 new sports games in total. None of these get anything remotely close to what I called feature coverage. It's several paragraphs describing the game, but no rundown of controls and mechanics, no rundown of team selection, which is especially a big thing when we're dealing with games which may or may not have the license for the sporting organization that the game is played in or the sport is played in. Some of them have right on their sleeves, like the EA games, but plenty don't. So, frankly, the best of these games will probably get some additional coverage in the future, and if the additional coverage happens, I will cover those games then. But in the meantime, these don't fit my criteria for whether or not a game is featured, and consequently, I'm not going to review them. Next up is Firepower 2000, a shooter from Sunsoft with two vehicles you can play as, either as a helicopter, which plays like a conventional shooter, or a jeep, which kind of plays like Jackal. And there are notes on all six stages of the game. So, the guide isn't exactly accurate. If you are playing single player, then you are just playing as the jeep. You do not have the option to play as the helicopter unless you are playing in two player, in which case player two is the helicopter. 
Additionally, the Jeep shoots in whatever direction you moved in last when you press down the fire button. From there, when you hold down the button, then you keep firing in that direction. And unlike Jackal, the game is forced scrolling. This makes for a title that plays less like Jackal and more like a amped up Ikari Warriors. It's not great, but it works and it appears to have unlimited continues. It isn't really a standout title, and it doesn't have any real sense of character to it, but it's certainly playable. In classified information, there's a code for Desert Strike that gives you 10 lives. And in Counselor's Corner, we have a tip on finding the Crystal Sword in Final Fantasy II for the Super Nintendo. Next up, we have a new comic strip from the creators of Super Mario Adventures. Mario vs. Wario. This time... As the title suggests, the strip involves Wario and Mario, setting up the backstory between the two. Moving into Game Boy titles, we have Incredible Crash Tummies, a platformer based on a toy line inspired by public safety announcements about seatbelts. There are worse things for a licensed game to come from. The article has maps of the first three levels and notes on the fourth and fifth levels. Incredible Crash Tummies is effectively a collection of mini-games for the Game Boy, based on the concept of the commercials and the toy line. You have to smash your crash dummy in a series of challenges with specific criteria you must accomplish before completing the crash. Gameplay is incredibly fast, to such a degree that a game over is never really much of a setback, and the game is short enough that it works almost perfectly for waiting room play. If the game saved high scores, it would be perfect, and I'm actually somewhat surprised now, the game hasn't been remade for phones yet, or for digital download on consoles or on the PC with online leaderboards and, that, and achievements and that sort of thing. After Radar Mission did its own spin on the formula, we have an adaptation of the original Battleship game on the Game Boy. So, this game cheats. Like, blatantly and badly. Sometimes both you and the AI will only get one shot on a turn, but sometimes the AI will get two to three shots on a turn to your one. Considering the whole game mechanic on Battleship is focused around using blind firing to find enemy ships, getting multiple shots completely unbalances the game. I might cut this game some slack and let the player get multiple shots as well, but it never does that. Get Radar Mission instead. Next up is The Humans, a Lemmings-inspired game on the Game Boy. The Humans is a much slower-paced game than the Lemmings, the Lemmings, in part because Lemmings... the title characters automatically move across the map without anything stopping them, save for your interference by changing the jobs of the Lemmings. Instead, in The Humans, you directly control the movement of the humans manually with the remaining humans standing passively by when they are not under your direct control. The verbs that the, play, that the characters have available to them vary based on what items they carry, with each human only being able to carry one item. Thus, the number of humans you have available, and the verbs allowed by each tool, will determine what options, options you have available to you to resolve the game's puzzles. My main complaint, though, is that there's no way to easily reset a level if, for some reason, you accidentally make a level unbeatable by, using it, by losing a tool when you still need it and the verbs it provides. Further, what verbs that are tool-exclusive are rather nonsensical. For example, you can't do a running jump without the spear, when, unless you're pole vaulting, you should be able to do a running jump at any time. Still, this is a well-thought-out game, and it's a good spin on the Lemmings formula. I wouldn't mind playing this game on the Super Nintendo or the NES were it to be ported for the systems. Next, we come to Mega Man 3, which has been ported to the Game Boy. We have notes on the two waves of Robot Masters you face, and a recommended starting place with Snake Man. For the previous two Game Boy Mega Man titles, I raised the complaint that developers had failed to managed to balance the expressive sprites that the Mega Man series is known for with level designs that worked with the platforming that is the other aspect of the series' popularity. Mega Man 3 on the Game Boy finally gets that right. 
the platforming has been simplified enough to work with the size of the sprites in the game, which are expressive enough to carry over that aspect of the game's appeal. I'm not doing great at the game in this footage, mainly because I'm focusing on showcasing levels over doing the recommended order and getting good. However, this version of the game feels right. The jumping and the sliding, the, attack of the, the attacks and design of the enemies, play with the little subtle tells that let you know that they're going to attack. All in all, this is the point, I think, where Mega Man games on the Game Boy are going to go from mediocre to legitimately good. Staying on the Mega Man topic, we have a bunch of the entrants from the Robot Master Design Contest here. I particularly like Copter Man and Bee Man, because I like to think that if they were incorporated into the game, they give the Blue Bomber some traversal abilities beyond just the stuff he gets from Rush, like the Rush Jet and that sort of thing. Moving on to the NES, we have the latest Mega Man game on that system with Mega Man 5, which is a fairly rare game. This time, Proto Man appears to have turned evil. We have maps for all the Robot Masters, but not really a recommended order. Of note, the weapons that the guide mentions primarily in their boss strategies is the Mega Buster, with that working against all the Robot Masters. Well, Mega Man 5 is another NES Mega Man game. That's not a bad thing by any means. The movement and the jump physics are perfect. They've been polished to a gleam, gleaming sheen in the earlier games in the series, and it still works here. The ability to charge the Mega Buster to a second tier removes a degree of button mashing from the game that was there before. Instead of having to rapidly press the shoot button to get more shots off, you're just basically holding down the fire mount button for an almost equivalent period of time to fire off a more powerful shot. It's still effective, it's still useful, and I won't say it takes away from the damage from the difficulty of the game anymore otherwise. He's not in any, any sort of logical difficulty. I'm not deeply into the minutiae of the Mega Man series as other players are, in spite of having played every game in the series thus far, but with the enhanced power of the Mega Buster, it doesn't feel like a negative. Further from the looks of things, the Mega Buster doesn't necessarily nullify the need to figure out the game's boss order, so all in all, I consider this game a fun and enjoyable experience. While the NES cartridge is fairly expensive these days, there's also the Mega Man Anniversary Collections for the GameCube and the PlayStation 2, which are still fairly affordable. After several years of Nintendo Power, and as we approach the end of the NES's life, we have a sequel to RC Pro-Am, RC Pro-Am 2, with the original being one of the NES's launch titles, basically. The article has notes on some of the tracks. RC Pro-Am 2 is a game that has failed to learn a lot of the lessons that other racing games had learned on consoles throughout the life of the NES, and for that matter, the Super Nintendo. You don't need to have limited continues in your racing game. Further, if the player fails out of a race, progressing them onto the next race doesn't actually help them. You're sending them to a higher difficulty course that they're clearly not ready for yet. If they were ready for it, they would have completed the last race. What you want to do is to keep them on that earlier race, either with a save or a password, until they are proficient enough to qualify, at which point you can move them on to the next race with the player theoretically being prepared enough to take on the next challenge. It encourages players to learn the courses, and if you attach a password or save system with it, it gives them an opportunity to take a break and revisit the course later, rather than trying to beat the game in one sitting. We have an, an, an NES Jets in the game with Cogswell's Caper, which I presume is meant as a tie-in to the animated film. We have maps of the first two levels and notes on the rest of the game. Wow, this game is... bad. The jumping art is really rough. The game depends on finding hidden items in boxes or the level environment, like in Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, but it hides enemies in the same places as a gotcha to discourage you from searching. The levels are designed with tighter movement in mind than your character can provide. It, it almost feels like this game began its life as something else was reskinned with the Jetsons, as with like the Bugs Bunny game on the Game Boy. Much to my surprise, this was not the case. 
In Nestor's Adventures, we have a really good tip for Desert Strike. If you have four MIAs on board your chopper and your armor is below 100, then when you go to the drop point, you'll get repaired. It's good to know. We have a special article about Mario Paint with tips on how to get the most out of the software. From here, we're getting into articles that are exclusive to subscribers to the magazine. Rather than having the Nesters Award this year, we have a rundown of the top 10 titles for each Nintendo platform from the last year. We start off with the Super Nintendo. Number 1. Street Fighter 2. Number 2. Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. Number 3. Contra 3. Number 4. Super Star Wars. Number 5. Mario Paint, which, as an aside, I probably would have rated higher. Number 6. Super Mario Kart. Number 7. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time. Number 8. Out of This World. Number 9. NCAA Basketball, which I wouldn't put on the list, but I understand being here due to the game's graphical glitz. And number 10, Road Runner's Death Valley Rally. And I probably would have put something else in this game's place. Moving on to the Game Boy. Number 1, Super Mario Land 2. Number 2, Mega Man 2. Number 3, Bionic Commando. Number 4, Tiny Toon Adventures. Number 5, Gradius. Number 6. Batman Return of the Joker. Number 7. Track and Field. Number 8. Kirby's Dreamland, which I would probably put higher on the list, say where Tiny Toons is. Number 9. Looney Tunes. And number 10. Yoshi. Wrapping things up with the NES. Number 1, Mega Man 4. Number 2, Darkwing Duck. Number 3, Lemmings. Number 4, TMNT 3, The Manhattan Project. Number 5, Rampart. Number 6, Star Trek. Number 7, Little Samson. Number 8, Captain America and the Avengers. Number 9, Gargoyles Quest 2. Number 10, Felix the Cat. I'm not as big a fan of the NES list. I'd probably put Panic Restaurant in there in place of Rampart. Moving on, we have a tech article this issue covering the Super FX chip and CD-ROM gaming. On the Super FX side, we have a discussion on how the chip works and one of the first titles to take advantage of it, Star Fox. The article does a really great job of explaining the tech of poly polygonal graphics to the layman. The CD-ROM coverage uses the CDI for a lot of examples, leaving me to suspect that Nintendo was still focusing on the Philips deal over the revived Sony relationship, neither of which really went anywhere. Well, the Philips one did, but not in any way we'll see here, I suspect. As part of the promotional coverage for Star, Star Fox, we have here plans for a papercraft R-Wing. Next up, we have an article going behind the scenes of Nintendo's Evaluation Center, which is where games are sent for evaluation prior to the release or the decision to release the game. It's interesting to note that evaluators only have 30 minutes per game before they have to fill out their evaluation form and then have to move on to the next title. The values that are used from these evaluations are used to determine the ratings for each game Nintendo Power, something which I haven't covered very much thus far, and I'm not sure I will cover much in the future, even though now I know the methodology. We get the formula for the ratings and a sample form. Next up is the art, an article billed as the best of classified information with some extra tips for subscribers. Of note is a mirror match trick for Street Fighter 2. We have some additional strategies for Super Mario Land 2 that show where the bonus stages are. Returning to general subscriber content, we come to the top 20 column. 
The first party titles almost dominate the rankings for the Game Boy, at least in the top four. Final Fantasy remains popular on all three platforms, and Dragon Warrior 3 is still in the rankings for the NES. The Now Playing column has undergone a format, format change again. The reviews are gone, replaced with a description of each game, an info block with each title containing the planned release date and an MSRP. In addition with the description, there is also one positive and one negative for each game. Of note in the covered also ran titles are Imperium from Vic Tokai for the Game Boy and Young Indiana Jones Chronicles for the NES from Jalico. The Pack Watch column features the upcoming NES Super Nintendo port of Ultima 8 and Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening for the Game Boy. However, no import titles are covered this issue. My pick of this issue is Mickey's Magical Quest for the Super Nintendo with Mega Man 5 coming in a close second. We Almost had an issue where every Nintendo system had a good game for it, which was rather impressive, and I like that. Hopefully, next month, Nintendo Power can improve with a hat trick. We'll see you then. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospective, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you mentioned in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching. And see you next time.